So welcome everyone um, to our fifth in the Teaching with uh, Primary Sources in Tennessee History Day webinar series. Um, we are really excited to have you with us today um, as we move into our third and final week of the series. Um, again, just a reminder for those of you, um, many of you probably already heard this before, um, while we are in the midst of the presentation, we do ask that you keep your mics muted. We'll let you know when we go to the breakout rooms um, to unmute yourself at the end. Um, if you would, to help Hannah um, keep attendance today, um, if you will locate your name on the participant list and make sure that you show up as your first and last name. If not, you can rename yourself. Just click on more there and you should have an option to hit rename. And again, just use your first and last name and that helps Hannah tremendously in keeping attendance throughout the session. Um, we are, again, keep working to make these sessions as interactive as possible. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat box. Um, so locate that towards the bottom of your screen, open that up. If you would go ahead and introduce yourselves, um, and that would be a good way to kind of get the, the session rolling, um, ask questions, make comments, and we will definitely be responding to those um, throughout the session there in the chat box. Um, you also have the option to use reaction buttons. Um, we aren't going to be doing any polling today, but we will be using breakout rooms um, here in just a little bit as a chance to get you guys um, chatting with each other about some sources that we're going to look at um, in today's session. Um, and just a reminder that you can follow along all of the resources for each of the sessions in this webinar series are available on our Padlet. Um, if you've not checked that out yet, I do encourage you to do so. You can use the QR code here to access that or the link here. Um, and again, we are posting the recordings for each of these sessions from our YouTube channel um, are also added to the Padlet um, after they're posted. So that's a one-stop shop for, again, all the PowerPoints, the resources, the recordings. Um, so feel free to share those with your colleagues or go back there and look for additional um, information. Um, and again, this is the fifth um, in the series we are doing today, uh, historical context. And so thinking about how we teach and approach teaching context and uh, context within primary source analysis. Um, tomorrow's final session, we'll be looking at National History Day as both an extracurricular activity or as a classroom project. So with that in mind, I am going to turn things over to Layla, who's going to talk to us some about historical context. All right. Hi, guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen with you. All right, cool. So can everybody hear me? If you can, just give me a thumbs up reaction. See my screen. Awesome. OK, good. So uh, my name is Layla Smallwood, and I'm a graduate research assistant with Teaching with Primary Sources, MTSU. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, historical thinking skill context. So we're going to be looking at historical context. Um, as we all know, contextualization is key when explaining events and time periods to our students and when looking at our resources. So I want to discuss um, context together for a moment using the chat box. So in the chat box, can you first answer for me, what is historical context? Okay. So what do you think historical context is or what do you know historical context is okay we've got the way the world looks around the event or events that you're studying um, the situation at the time the source is created um, accurate information based on the acceptable norms of the time period um, setting characters esp which we'll get to later culture nation beliefs um, the social situations, the economic situations, um, the attitudes, everything going on around the same time as the source you're researching. Awesome. So a lot of good answers there. Um, and some of you kind of touched on this already, but why is it important for our students to understand historical context when learning about events, people, time periods, legislation, um, all of our resources that we have when we're teaching history? Why is it important that our students understand historical context? 
So if you have any answers to that, just like you did with the first question, just put those in the chat box. In order to see the big picture, just nice and simple and perfect way to put it. And yeah. to understand why the, the hardest of the W's gives meaning, it makes connections, um, and it shows that thinking changes through time and it makes, um, it makes the learning more meaningful. It frames, it provides a structure for the situation to know why people did what they did. <laughs> um, reminds students that there's no social media back then, uh, which face palm that we have to do that, but yep. Uh, they have <laughs> trouble getting at historical empathy if they don't have the context. So it connects to those other Ooh. skills. Um, and that way they can understand the climate going on at the time and understand that people had different attitudes in the past, not just what they're familiar with today. Awesome. Yeah, so a lot of good answers. And I like that you guys brought in connection to those other historical thinking skills as well, because without context, how can we understand the source? How can our students understand the source? I like to say contextualization is key when looking at and analyzing sources. Good. Anything else before I go on? All right, cool. So just a few pieces and I link to this at the end of the slide as well. This is from um, a different state library. I think it's Minnesota, but I could, could be off on that. My brain just kind of went blank. Um, so just questions to consider when you're looking at a source and things to push your students to do. We all already do this in the classroom. So think about who created this source. Why was the source created? When was the source created? How might, somebody mentioned ESP in the chat box earlier, how might economic, social, and or political factors have influenced the creation or the public perception of this source that you're looking at? Um, and what does this source tell us about the time period in which it was created? Um, so those are just some questions to kind of get your students going and to get us going this morning as well, because um, we're getting back into the swing of things as we go back to school, right? So I've got to get our brains working. So um, this is a primary source analysis tool. We do this a lot in our workshops. I like to use this in our workshops because I think I've mentioned this before, but everybody can come to the table when we're looking at a primary source analysis tool. Um, when using it with your students, everybody can make an observation. Everybody can ask questions. They might not have the reflect or the no part of your see no wonder yet, but they can observe and question. And I'm sure you guys do something like this or use this tool or do a see no wonder in your classroom um, all the time. So we're going to do a quick primary source analysis together um, on an image. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Um, so let me just go over and just keep this observe, reflect, question, see no wonder in mind. So first I want you guys to start with what you see. Don't pull in any background knowledge yet. I know that's really hard for our teachers, um, but just type in the chat box what you see. Oh, someone's jumping ahead. Um, oh no. <laughs> but uh, but what some people see are masks, people wearing masks on a platform, uh, seeing their clothes looking older. Uh, they, you can't see 1918 in here. You guys are skipping ahead, but um, but I understand. Um, see, it's the hardest. Yes, a, a sign. Someone sees a sign that's communicating wear a mask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no problem, Lee. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> uh, group of people sign saying you could go to jail without wearing a mask. Uh, railroad tracks, good eye. Um, I see some what some poles with some wires on them. Um, well, somebody's guessing cold weather because of the coats, but that goes in the middle column. Telephone pole, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if it would be telephone or telegraph, so we just see polls. Black and white photo, good job. The, that's so obvious sometimes people don't put that. Um, some rain or puddles on the ground. That's what, I didn't notice that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, somebody doesn't see the visual. So I don't know if that's a problem on their end um, or not. Huh. Both males and females. People standing close. Yeah, I haven't done that with a bunch of people in a long time. Uh, hats? Yeah, hats. Everyone is wearing hats. 
I just okay. want to if you're Yoko having pointed out what I see. The first thing I saw is the nose. Woman not wearing the mask. Correct. Yeah. The nose. <laughs> I have seen that way too often in like the grocery stores. Um, okay, people wear with arms around uh, other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And I do want to point out, if you can't see this source, if you're the person having visual issues, this is also on the Padlet. So you can go in and pull it up as well if you just go to that Padlet, if you're having trouble seeing it on my screen. And um, these are in a PDF as well as a PowerPoint file. Cool. Um, a couple more things, Layla. Uh, people yeah. looking at the background, which is always a good idea. A mountain, also some sort of two-story building uh, on a hill. All right, cool. Anything else before I go on? You guys had a lot of observations about this photo. I was uh, a lot of C observations on this. I was really excited to see everybody so into it. Anything else? Well, people are again kind of extrapolating what the seasons are, which I think is getting, it's a good segue for you to go into column two then. That's true though. So I'm going to go back really quickly. So we just did the observe column. Now we're going to go into the reflect or your no column that you do with your students. So by people who kind of jump the gun, what do you know about this picture or this image? Well, I, I will go back and review those. 1918 <laughs> Spanish flu epidemic, partly because of historical background knowledge, partly because a lot of people said the clothes look like 19-teens, 1920s, and also a lot mm -hmm. of people saying that this must be like fall or winter because it, they're wearing heavy um, coats. Um, so a lot of people are already like placing it in a certain time frame because of the clothing and because of course it's a black and white image so all right anything else we know all right i'm gonna go back one more and our question column our wonder column so what questions do you have about this image in the chat box just go ahead and type those for us it is not Lower Broadway, Nashville on a Saturday night. <laughs> no. uh, the question, uh, where are they? I wonder if they survived. I'm guessing you mean the flu. <laughs> um, where are they traveling to? Like, yeah, are they, are they about to get on a train? Did they just get off a train? Yeah, that's good. And did, they, did people really get sent to jail if they didn't wear a mask? back then. Someone's guessing Pennsylvania because it looks, I guess, kind of Appalachian. Um, I, do we see some sort of familial relationships represented here? Um, were they in concern for their community that they're informing travelers? Um, who are these people? Where did they get that sign? Um, were they a whole family or was this just kind of, did they meet on the platform? And was this a rule, like across the whole country? Was it limited? Was it local? I mean, that's a really good question. All right, so a lot of good questions. Anything else before I go on? Okay, cool. So you guys have a lot of good questions and we know that our students are the best at creating questions, right? They always want to know more and ask more. So I love the questioning column. It really pushes you to think outside of the box and understand the source a little bit more in depth. Cool, so I'm gonna go to the source information for this and this might answer a few questions. Um, oh, here it is. All right, so this is a group of mask wearing citizens, Locust Avenue, California during the flu pandemic of 1918. That's a mouthful, but that's the title. Um, and it's a photograph taken by Raymond Coyne courtesy of um, Lucretia Little History Room, um, the Mill Valley Public Library. And it's actually trademarked or copyrighted, I guess, um, from the annual Dipsy race. <clears throat> so you guys got all of the information right um, with the, the year, the pandemic surrounding it. Um, but nobody guessed California. I wouldn't have guessed California at this point either. Um, the annual Dipsy race, I actually looked it up. It's a trail running event in California. It's the oldest cross country trail running event and one of the oldest foot races of any kind in the United States. I had no idea. I know, so it's a seven and a half mile um, long Dipsy race and it's been held annually almost every year since November 19th, 1905. So they didn't cancel it for 
the Spanish influenza, right? They didn't cancel it for that in 1918. Um, it celebrated its 109th running um, anniversary on Sunday, June 9th, 2019, but due to the COVID pandemic or COVID-19 pandemic, the race committee announced that the 2020 Dipsy race was gonna be canceled. So they didn't cancel it for the flu pandemic in 1918 or flu pandemic in 1918, but they're canceling it for COVID-19 today. Thought that was a little bit of interesting um, our history today that we could put into this picture. So we've dated it to 1918. It's the flu pandemic, of course, um, or flu Spanish influenza epidemic. Um, but now that we've dated it, what significant events were happening in the United States at this time? So of course we have the flu, but what else is happening? Right away, World War I, of course. Mm -hmm. The Red Scare. Uh, women's suffrage movement, prohibition, okay good so we have a lot of different things going on at the same time as the 1918 flu um, and I think that's important for us to emphasize with our students, these events aren't happening separate from each other. They're all connected. These events all tie in together to create what we know as 1918, right? What we think of when we think of the year 1918 or 2020. All of these events are coming together to create history and how we think of a time period. Good. Anything else before I go on? All right. So there's that source just one more time. And we're going to be using the primary source analysis to see no wonder again for our next activity. So just keep that um, observe, um, no, I can't even remember what it is, I'm sorry. Observe, reflect, question. I always want to say see no wonder, but it's not the Library of Congress one. So our observe, reflect, question, just keep that in mind as we're going through. All right, guys, so we're going to go to breakout sessions um, in just a moment. And in your breakout sessions, we're going to have one person assigned. We've already assigned this person um, to go in and share their screen with you so you can all look at a document together. Um, but we also want you guys to pick one person to share your group source and observations during the final um, discussion we're going to have. So I will share your source on the screen. Just have somebody from your breakout group that's willing to talk about what you discussed in your group. Um, so in your groups, you're going to complete an informal primary source analysis. So just that see no wonder one more time for your source. You're also going to consider the way um, the economic, social, and political elements impacted the creation uh, and perception or digestion of this specific source. So how did the economic, social, and political elements impact this source creation and public perception? And while you're in your groups, if you have time, I want you to consider what societal elements other than economic, social, and political can you think of that shape historical context? So what other elements outside of economic, social, and political shape the way we think of sources and shape historical context? I want you to consider how current events can help us understand the past and how can events in one area help us understand events elsewhere? So I want you to keep these questions in mind and I'm not going to throw you to the wolves. All of these questions are also on the PDF and the person who's in your group that's sharing the source will also be able to share these questions with you or you can access them on your own computer by going to the Padlet. It's just under the PDF document for today's, source, um, today's session. So, so you might have questions. Okay, awesome. So these are the, the top instructions for breakout sessions. I wanted you guys to do your um, informal primary source analysis and kind of dig into the, the ESP elements as well. The other questions to consider, I don't know if you guys had time to get there, um, but if you did, please share that with us. So as we go into our sharing, in just a moment, your person who you nominated to share, um, Tell us what your group found in the um, See No Wonder, your primary source analysis. Um, talk to us a little bit about your ESP. 
analysis. You don't have to give us the play by play. Um, just give us some of the highlights throughout. And if you got to the three questions, um, please share that with us as well, because I know my group, we didn't get to that point. Okay, so the first group, this was titled Precautions Against Influenza. It's dated 1915 to 1925, but we can see on here, it's like 1920 up at the top. Um, so when we're looking at it at first, just looking at it, we see instructions, right? We see a lot of words, um, some are bolded, it's stamped, it says approved on it. So much of the stuff that we can see is very straightforward. Um, what we know about this is it's dated 1920. Um, it's signed by somebody in the US Navy, a captain. Um, it was approved by an admiral. Um, and it, we can read it and it's giving straightforward instructions on how to avoid influenza um, and how to stop the spread. It's, they know how it's spread. Um, they are able to give people instructions. It says avoid common drinking cups, things like that. So how to avoid spreading this and how to avoid catching it in the first place. Um, and our questions, we had a lot of questions about the um, export, I can't expectorate promiscu promiscuously. Um, that was one of the questions in there. Somebody said it should be put on a t-shirt. What does it mean? Um, how would this impact other people, other family members, maybe who couldn't avoid common drinking cups or who couldn't not go to work? Um, how would it impact city life versus people living in the country? Um, so we had a lot of questions surrounding um, where you are, where you're living, and class as well, and job, jobs, um, professions as well. So in the ESP, the economics, um, obviously we have avoid persons with coughs and cold, and we said how can people who need to go to work to fuel the economy, how could that be avoided, right? Or how could that impact the economy if people can't go out and buy and spend their money? So a lot of similarities to what we're seeing today. Um, social, we thought it says avoid common drinking cups, again, not many families, I mean, many families could, but some families couldn't avoid common drinking cups. Um, if you, if obliged to cough or sneeze, don't do so when you're near another person, right? Turn away. In social settings, that might not always happen. You're gonna be close to people, especially if you work in a factory or in a setting where you're closer to people. Um, and also social, like you have, somebody mentioned social, you have spittoons, you have public spittoons at this point. You have people sharing different different parts of public space, like drinking fountains and things today during COVID-19 that would scare us, they're using these pieces in social settings still. And people probably aren't going to abide by all of these rules, right? You're gonna have some people kind of shirk these responsibilities and still go into the social setting. Um, and the last thing political um, for this one, we've said that this is very straightforward, this document. It doesn't seem to have like one political leaning or the other. It's not super biased. It's just saying these are the expectations and this is the reality that we're living in. But again, you have it being um, issued by a Navy captain and signed by an admiral. So you have a lot of different um, political pieces here. It's impacting our military. It's impacting the way we are um, in society kind of moving Politically, your political leanings wearing a mask, even today, that sometimes is seen as a political statement. The people in our first image were wearing a mask that said, wear a mask or go to jail. So you can politicize this, even if this document is not politicized. So a lot of different pieces of that um, fall into the ESP. And like I said, we didn't get into those three questions in our group, um, but maybe other groups did. So I'm going to go to um, source three now. This is, uh, we, we also bullied uh, someone into speaking for us and we, we chose John Malik. John? John. Um, yeah, I was volunteered uh, with a second. Um, this was from a newspaper, uh, How to Wear a Mask in Portland, Oregon, in January 12, 1919. I looked that up. That was a Sunday paper. So that would have had a wide circulation. 
But one of the question, one of the things we noticed about it was it does show wearing a mask. Uh, this was a newspaper on the page 23. So one of the questions we had was this uh, art, this uh, direction in previous newspapers on a page one. Okay, the mask shows two gentlemen. Now the page, the article shows two gentlemen, and how to stamp out the Spanish flu. One of the things I noticed, our group noticed, was you can substitute Spanish flu with China flu, and how patriotic it is to wear the mask. It is not compulsory. Uh, gave specific to the article, if you look at the little box on the bottom here, uh, very specific on how to wear the mask, where not to wear the mask, where to, yeah, where to wear the mask, go into stores, uh, you, you know, everywhere you go in public, wear a mask is highlighted movie theaters. It also told you you go to stores to buy the mask, okay, so keep the stores in business. Um, that also was very specific, very specific on how to care for the mask, wear it once, then you boil it for five minutes after wear it, wear it again, avoid going with people to uh, clothing. Uh, one of the reasons for wearing a mask was it was uh, to protect you instead of protection for protecting from you, okay? It was to protect you. Uh, questions that we had was, again, was this an earlier newspaper um, that is signed by two doctors from California? What was the, uh, how did the, uh, the two doctors from California and the, it was from the University of San Francisco, how did they, how did, did Portland pick up on why did they go to the port newspapers? Was it syndicated on the West Coast? Uh, then we ran out of time. <laughs> did I miss anything, uh, Dr. Graham? Uh, no, that, that sounded like a, a really good um, summary to us. Uh, though we did also talk about how this really emphasizes making your own and getting a pattern at stores. So the whole kind of culture of making your own clothes. Yeah. So that's what we just ran out of time. Yeah, yeah, we know. Uh, we did too. There was a lot. Yeah. There yeah. was so much in the short period of time, but it was a good discussion, real good discussion. It was a very good group. Good. Thank you, John. And everybody's kind of concerned with the mask here. They're saying the original duck face, things like that. People are kind of thrown off by this mask. Yeah. So hopefully it was informative and a little bit entertaining the same time. All right, group three. Let me go here. Um, and you had source four, which is a newspaper clipping. Hey, so um, this one comes from the Ogden Standard and in Ogden, Utah. And one of the things that we noticed, first of all, is that it doesn't actually say flu or Spanish influenza. It uses a more, we thought, old-fashioned term. Um, it talks about having the grip, which is actually something that, like, a couple of us have family members that we've heard use that term before, although this is evidently, I guess, not the way it's normally spelled, so that was kind of, we had an interesting discussion about that, um, and this is actually focusing on the schools and saying that um, this, you know, epidemic has afflicted, um, it says one school, every single kid is sick, and then it goes on to say that adults are also getting sick. But this is nothing to worry about unless it leads to pneumonia. So one of the things that we kind of thought was interesting with this is on one hand, it's telling you that, you know, all these kids are sick, but it's sort of downplaying it a little bit. And um, we kind of wondered if maybe that's just because there was so much sickness in 1918 that people just kind of expected kids to be sick a lot because there weren't a lot they could do about it otherwise. Um, <clears throat> And then it also goes on to talk about um, a report from New York. So, you know, we talked a little bit about how Ogden, Utah was getting their information from New York. Is this coming across like a wire service? Um, and that says, again, that the danger of this is really the pneumonia that follows. And it has just a little mention about the cases in the Army. And so somebody pointed out that, um, <clears throat> Wilson actually sort of de-emphasized the epidemic because he did not want to interrupt the flow of 
soldiers going to fight. So that kind of got back to that political effect of it. Um, and then we noted that, you know, the article, it doesn't mention anything about like school closures. It doesn't mention anything about people having to miss work. Um, so a lot of a lot of that is sort of left as a, a question that we had on this article. Is there anything else I missed that we needed to add in, group mates? All right, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so great pieces. And this is actually from Chronicling America. And Dr. Graham is going to show you in a moment how to navigate Chronicling America and um, get resources like this. But I like that you noticed that grip is spelled differently than maybe what we think of when our family members are talking about it. And our students probably wouldn't even understand the term grip, right? We'd have to backtrack and talk about the differences in language. I think we saw a lot of that in these sources, the way language kind of shifts through time. Um, in my group specifically, we said that it's, it's much different. Students wouldn't maybe understand some of the words, the way they wrote, the way they talked. Um, so we definitely have to break this down with students. And I like that you pointed that out. Good, and a lot of parallels, right, to what we're seeing in today's society. A little bit of a rhyme um, in that. Good, so other comments before we go on? Okay, cool. Um, so I am going to show you guys just really quickly our um, ESP analysis worksheet. So this is something you can use with your students when you do an economic, social, and political um, analysis of a source. We didn't use this sheet today to write in our notes, um, but this is great for students to have their own hard copy. Um, so this ESP sheet is available through our website on um, TPS MTSU. If you go under um, analysis worksheets, it'll be right there. It's a great way for students to organize their notes when doing an analysis like this. And I also have this linked at the end of our PowerPoint along with the primary source analysis if you wanna go and check those out. And again, that's all available on the Padlet. So in closing, what other sources would or could you provide students with to better understand the context in which these specific sources were created? So in the chat box, is there something else you would give students to kind of understand and make sense of these sources? Do you think in your classroom images, newspapers, maps, what would well, work? Yeah, uh, somebody put a timeline, which is always a really great condensed way of providing context. Um, I was gonna suggest maps as well. Um, looking at the length of the sickness and maybe um, where, where uh, like how, how badly it had hit in the places that we had just talked about. Um, what about sanitation committees, uh, Red Cross stuff going on? So like from a health point of view, um, population records. So mm -hmm. looking at, again, the impact and the demographics. Um, <laughs> newspapers, uh, references about language and vocabulary, because like you'd said, sometimes students won't understand that words might mean something different today. Um, uh, Providing them with some sort of advanced organizer to provide context before they look at sources. Um, maybe have them write their own newspaper ad. Uh, maybe with pictures of their own mask wearing faces. Uh, okay. Um, all right. And, and mentioning that, you know, people back then had to wash uh, and couldn't just go to the store and buy a three pack as easily as we can today. Um, Oh, someone mentioned that there's a documentary that has a lot of images from the Spanish flu that you can show. Oh. Um, and some kind of clips from culture, like radio broadcasts or movies from 1919, which would be really cool. Be great. Uh, and you can, you can find a lot of uh, recordings from like circa 1920 onward at the National Jukebox on the Library of Congress, by the way. Yeah. Um, One more thing I do want to plug, since somebody mentioned timeline, I didn't put it in this, but the CDC has a great timeline um, for all of like outbreaks that you can think of. And there's one for the Spanish influenza. It's fantastic. There's a timeline, there are images, 
really helpful if you're looking for a timeline for something like this to um, provide context for your students. Yeah, and I think that we link to that timeline from our recent newsletter on historic epidemics from like April or May of this year. Yeah, I think it was May. I don't know. Okay. This whole semester has been a blur. You could you could actually bring a pattern and whatever butter paper is, uh, and have your students make masks there in class. Oh, <laughs> maybe the whole fashion there's in the duck mask that we saw. In that the was story. frightening. <laughs> so, was do you guys have any suggestions or? Anything you would adapt to make this better meet your students' learning needs? I know we talked about using different medias, um, different sources in that way. And I feel like that's supposed to be adaptations. So that kind of threw me off. Sorry, not adaptions. Sorry. Um, having, having your students take duck face selfies with masks. <laughs> That might make it seem like more fun, the reward at the end of the lesson. Yeah, that mask looked like the one where somebody had cut it and like it opened like a puppet, which is just... Well, you can drink out of your straws that way, right? Much easier to eat and drink out in public. All right, awesome. So is there anything else before I go on? Suggestions, comments? I just wanted to go to the last slide. These are all um, the handouts that we've used today. The University of Minnesota Libraries, that's where I got those questions in the beginning. It has a great um, putting things into historical context link. Um, Chronicling America, which Dr. Graham's going to show you, our primary source analysis tool and the ESP tool. And then our four sources that we use today are all hyperlinked as well. Um, all right, so thank you so much for your time and for being great participants. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and turn it over to Dr. Graham. Okay, um, I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to, sh to kind of review, because I know a lot of you have, um, you know, seen some of these places before in some of our previous workshops. Um, but just a quick review on where you would find Chronicling America from the Library of Congress homepage, which I hope you can see right now on my screen. Um, the quickest way that I get there is to go down here to Digital Collections, which is usually the second tab underneath the main image. And then it's usually this, this one that pops up in the featured content uh, slide bar, Chronicling America. And you can see how it's changed in the URL. It says chroniclingamerica.loc.gov, so you can always just get there directly if you save that as a bookmark. And one thing I want to say about using newspapers that uh, Leila touched on uh, and, and Rebecca discussed is uh, your students need to know that when they go to a search, there are so many different terms, uh, so they don't want to just search on like Spanish influenza, you know, they'll have to search Spanish flu, they should also just search influenza. And you can do a date range, uh, you know, 1917 to 1919, that would make it easier. Um, but also words like the grip, both GRIP and GRIPPE, which I've seen it before too. Uh, that song from Guys and Dolls is now stuck in my head. But anyway, um, but uh, so there, the vocabulary issue will affect their search results. But another thing real quickly I want to show you um, that I thought was neat that John mentioned about the newspaper we were looking at was that it was a Sunday only newspaper. And so that can give you clues about its circulation and you can find information. I'm just going to go to one uh, just to show you as an example. Um, so when you go to a newspaper search page, you can actually get context about the newspaper itself by going to this little about line underneath. And that will give you information about like um, maybe the date ranges. And a lot of times these newspapers had specific political slants or agendas. And that's something that this important context for reading the articles within. And it can talk to you about circulation, about audience, about ownership. Uh, and other kinds of political, economic, and social interests. So that's something that provides context for looking at newspaper articles. Um, so uh, that's Chronicling America. And another thing, uh, you, some of you might remember, 
uh, for some really common or uh, some topics they've already done for you. So under this little menu, they have recommended topics. And so they've already um, kind of pulled together a lot of articles about specific topics and usually American, but some world history, uh, African American history, American enterprise. And so check here to see if there's something about what you're teaching. I know there's a page here about the Spanish flu epidemic. Um, again, that's also linked in one of our um, earlier, uh, th that newsletter that I mentioned. Um, okay, and so that, that was Chronicling America, which is right here. Uh, one more thing about a good place to provide context that uh, I wanted to show you, the teacher's blog um, at the Library of Congress is a good, it's really well set up. Uh, and if I'm going to the teacher's page, it's going to be right underneath the big black box, go to the blog. And what I like about all their articles is that's what it is. They, they, they set up a topic within a context. And so when you only have uh, a small blog, of course, you're, you're reading through uh, a little bit of context. Um, of course, this is just an interview set up right here. Um, but, uh, and that's just a really good quick way. Uh, same thing with like reading today in history articles on the Library of Congress newsletter, et cetera. Um, all right, and the last thing I wanna show you is again, quick review for most of you where you can find those worksheets on our website. So this is our uh, TPS MTSU website. They're under tools for educators. You go to the analysis worksheets and this is where you'll find all those things that Layla was talking about, including some additional ones that are good for context like the HIPPO one and the, um, the text context subtext, uh, which was adapted from something that I use when I teach class. Uh, thinking like a historian, synthesizing sources, all these things are great ways to have students visualize bits and pieces of context with use for a primary source. So, um, Kira, did you uh, want to add anything or did we want to open up to any kind of questions or anything like that? I'm going to stop yeah. sharing. I think we can open it up if anyone has any questions, uh, if you want to drop those in the chat box uh, for us and we will get ready to start wrapping up as we are almost uh, to the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, and we do try to, to stick with our time frame here. Um, so as you guys are putting in any questions that you might have, I just want to remind you that tomorrow is the final uh, webinar in this series. Um, so we'll be doing uh, National History Day as an extracurricular activity or as a classroom project. Um, so join us again tomorrow for that one. Uh, if you've missed any of our previous webinars, uh, you want to go back and see those. Again, those can all be found on our Teaching with Primary Sources MTSU YouTube page. Um, the links for those specific videos um, are available on the Padlet as well. Uh, and again, if you missed the link for that, um, you can access it here. Uh, again, you can use that QR code uh, as well uh, as the link there to get to the Padlet. Um, the activity that we did today, both the PowerPoint uh, and Layla has also added uh, a PDF file that has all of the sources and things from today's um, activity there. So if you want to use that with your students, again, we invite you to do so. You can download all that material there off the Padlet. And don't forget that there is a survey form for you to fill out. Um, again, we do ask you to do this after the end of each of our webinars. So someone will drop that in the chat box for us. Um, you can find that um, the link there, fill that out for us, um, and that just helps us again to track uh, participation and um, to get some feedback from you. All right, so do we have any questions? All right, well, again, we want to thank you guys for your time and attention today. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, working with you um, and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.